All right, so thank you, Rose, for that introduction. Um, just to give a warning, uh, this I, I start relatively slowly with babies and then build to networks um, and it's about 30 minutes. And while I seem to use simple language and symbols, I encourage you to pay attention to both what's kind of visually in front of you and also what I say, because I'm trying to pump intuitions with a lot of your senses here and it very quickly builds up. So with that said, I will get started. So it is remarkable that I'm sitting here and I can utter these sounds and that they're intelligible to you and that you understand what I mean. Moreover, if I said on this call, I love you all, you could assume one of two things, I'm delusional or I'm lying. You not only understand what these sounds mean, you can also infer some things about me when I say them. But strings of sound don't just mysteriously convey meaning. Depending on your background beliefs, words have power. Strings of sound can stir men towards progress, start wars, turn the tide of wars, usher in peace, or motivate a generation. Language is human's greatest invention. And like food, language can either nourish us or poison us. And so the question today is, how do we govern and align exponentially powerful technologies built off our conversations, when in the conversations themselves, we are often debating, politicking, and fumbling our way towards truth? When we talk alignment, one string of sounds that resonates with this audience probably is the word decentralization. But what does this word mean? Many refer to other words to explain it. But perhaps the best way to understand decentralization is to look at the most decentralized invention that we have to date, language. And instead of modeling an idealized version of how language ought to work, maybe we should start with our intuitive and uncorrected view of language. And so let's start with basics and let's start with a word that has nourished us all from day one, love. We're born into this world, given a name, and this is our first contact with language and with love. We grow into a broader set of affections and solidarities, branching beyond our families to our schools and neighborhoods. And each of these communities are strange at first, and then they become familiar. And we have changing magnitudes of affection and trust towards them. Moreover, each of these communities have different conversational norms and boundaries. What you say, how you say it is different in each of these contexts. I love you, dad. I love you, school crush. I love you, sweet heavenly baby Jesus. Love means different things in each of these contexts. And yet there are other words that have unambiguous meanings like table, chair, and school. Learning language is learning correlations of words in social context. These correlations of words and context also become correlations of beliefs and desires. A mysterious interaction occurs between our hearts and our minds, correlating what we hear with what we believe and what we, what we want. Highly religious parents, for example, impart their beliefs to their children. In my nieces, kids will ask for a toy just because other kids have it, not knowing what it does. So it's through these interactions and conversations, starting at the dinner table, moving to the classroom and beyond, that we form and evolve our beliefs, desires, preferences, and the words to express them. As a kid, my siblings generally share the same memberships, the same social geometry with little distance. We are correlated in our beliefs and desires, and we're also correlated in how we use words to express them. But as we enter adolescence, we broaden our communities and self-differentiate. We form secret societies, we fall in love, we fall out of love and retreat to our families. And at some point, many choose to enter a more gated conversation where we agree to learn and get tested and measured how well we converse by discipline's rules. Some like math have right and wrong answers and some like law, like my own, have a rich set of procedural practices that are continually under conversational scrutiny, but nonetheless lay the ground rules for debating what the bounds of what is legal versus illegal, contested versus uncontested, admissible versus inadmissible and so on. And at some point we choose to enter, or actually we don't choose, we are we naturally enter into a larger political conversation where we have rights of participation and a say in how a larger nested coordination is governed. 
So as we age, we grow a rich network of overlapping solidarities and memberships to different communities with different magnitudes of affection. And these communities are perpetually in fluid stochastic recombination, contracting and expanding. But is this what we mean by decentralized language, recombining stochastic conversations? Well, no, sometimes conversations get snuffed out, groups get annihilated, languages disappear. Language does not have a peaceful decentralized equilibrium. Instead, communities have metastable governance structures, which influence how the conversation unfolds, what is said in what order, who says it, when, and how. One governance structure touted by the more egalitarian minded is one person, one vote, where everyone gets an equal say. Now, ancient Athens experimented with this, and it left the most skilled conversationalist of the time, Socrates, murdered by a tyranny of the majority. This coincided, of course, with the loss of the Peloponnesian War and the end of the Golden Age of Athens. Maybe this was not a coincidence. Now, there's a second touted model, raw capitalism, or one dollar, one vote, or one token, one vote, like Bitcoin, for example. The more dollars you have, the more hash power you can buy, the more Bitcoin you can mine. But let's look at this from the perspective of the community constituting Bitcoin in dark mode. Aspirationally, the Bitcoin community is a sea of anons subscribing to the rules of Bitcoin capitalism. But in one token, one vote capitalism, money buys power, literally hash power, and not everyone has the same resources to start with. And even if they do, no one shares the same savings and consumptions rate. So what do we end up with? Plutocracy, a panel of miners and pool operators that constitute 90% of Bitcoin's hash power all sitting on a conference panel together. But like direct democracy, plutocracy also has a social effect here too on our conversations. If one token, one vote is about buying influence, then the rich have more power and the social circles start to coalesce around them. Culturally, the less wealthy who aspire to have that kind of power begin to engage in speculation, hyper-financialization and looting networks through 51% attacks. Now, when one token, one vote models are applied to businesses with increasing returns, the power of plutocrats can increase exponentially. Apple farms subject to decreasing returns in classical economics is not the same as data farms subject to increasing returns. And the power of increasing returns can lead plutocrats to have outsized or correlated influence over political parties, national security, social media, and technology, including AI. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So how do these two models stack up against each other? With one person, one vote, votes are too cheap for those who care a little and too expensive for those who care a lot. With one dollar, one vote, or one token, one vote, the opposite is true. Votes are too expensive for those who care a little and too cheap for those who care a lot. But there's also a third model here, and that's authoritarianism. One person deciding what's communicated, how, and to whom. Now, the more information an authoritarian has, the greater control they exert, which allows them to control information even more in the self-reinforcing cycle towards greater and greater power. Inconvenient dissidents that challenge this power tend to disappear. And eventually people end up talking about what the dictator wants them to talk about and the social distance between conversational clusters narrows. Citizens become sibyls for the dictator, equivalent to mindless bots. And of course, we get language inversion, where meaning does not map onto reality and where we collapse into contradiction. It's no coincidence that the greatest abuses of power are marked also by the greatest abuses of language. So when it comes to governance over communication, we have these three general models, one person, one vote, one dollar, one vote, or one token, one vote, and authoritarianism. And each of these end up empowering some set of groups over others, tyrannical majorities, looting plutocrats, or controlling dictators. And this has social consequences on us. At worst, turning us into murderous majorities or hyper-financialized monkeys or civil robots. And all of them universally narrow and homogenize the social groups to which we belong, as well as a breadth and depth of conversation. But we generally don't see these extremes we see instead correctives or checks and balances pushing us towards something in the center, drawing on the virtue of these approaches, but compensating for their weaknesses. For example, 
direct democracy has given way to the idea of constitutional republics marked by separation of powers, constitutionalism, common law, federalism, and so on. And this compromise forces conversations amongst competing groups representing different interests, domestic circles, foreign circles, and even long dead founding fathers requiring some translation. Similarly, modern corporate governance is a rejection of peer token voting. And instead we have a compromise with the CEO board and shareholders with forced information disclosure by way of law to enrich these conversations. And even authoritarian regimes like to keep the optics of democracy with elections, even if rigged, and capitalism, even if crony. So in the 20th century, this simplistic model has given way to this autocracy, constitutional republics, and corporations. And with exponentially powerful information technology, the 21st century is seeing another variation on the same theme, digital democracy, synthetic technocracy, and corporate libertarianism. And today we see instances of all these governance structures in the diverse conversational communities to which we belong. Going back to kids, even they experience a variety of governance structures, which influences what, how, and when they talk. If born Catholic, they learn the Vatican's rules on what's conversationally unacceptable or heresy. If they go to a public, parochial, or private school, they get exposed to mixed governance, being accountable towards the state, church, and dollars in different degrees. And perhaps, of course, we see the greatest variance at the family's dinner table, except, of course, when kids outnumber their parents, and then it's pure anarchy. So these governance structures influence how conversations cluster and recombine, and more deeply, how words come to correlate with meaning, belief, and desires. Authoritarian regimes are an extreme example with greater clustering, less recombination, and collapse of meaning into contradiction. Now, the question is, how do generative foundation models and AI change conversational dynamics? Will they collapse us into the singularity like authoritarianism or majoritarianism with one person, one vote or plutocratic pump and dumps with one token, one vote? Or will we have some kind of rich intersectionality? Well, let's consider our latest touch point with digital communication, social media. In exchange for using these communitarian paradises for free, <laughs> we let them hoover up our conversations in a giant information commons where we graze on addictive algorithms, often feeding anger, paranoia, and vanity. So far, so good. But let's break down what's actually really happening here. We enter these channels ready to communicate, but our words travel instantaneously beyond the intended audience and context in which they were made causing socially distant audiences to misjudge, become outraged, and of course, engage. But even if our words aren't intended to become maximally controversial scissor statements, they become so. And this has several consequences. First, communication traveling beyond context has cleaved groups and artificially so. Algos aside, outraged groups pull in socially proximate conversational clusters into empathetic outrage. Second, because people are broadcasting to a giant conversational commons primed to graze on it in the most controversial way, speech is chilled. And instead, we encourage a different kind of speech, anonymous trolling in particular. And this unaccountable mob behavior leaves our digital spaces and invades our physical spaces, even into law schools like my alma mater, where the conversational norm is to make your case through coherent arguments, not masks and not memes. And what about the unseen? Well, by throwing people into a conversational commons and then outraging and cleaving them, we erase local conversational groups, local speech norms, local context. And these boundaries are important. Words do not have an inherent meaning, but are relational and contextual, embedded in a constellation of facts and circumstances, relationships, and most importantly, shared beliefs of the audience. When I say I love you, clearly that is not the same love as when I tell my son I love you. And by erasing these boundaries, instead of contextual communication, we get context collision, reducing our plurality into polarity, where people are confused, and our ability to communicate is fundamentally impaired. Rather than wrestle with hard and controversial ideas openly, we talk less, debate less, refine less, 
And instead we find ourselves unwittingly in cleaved conversational clusters in correlated meme and cancel culture verses. And these social media correlations become financial correlations. Finance becomes vulnerable to speculation and hyperfinancialization. Digital bank runs tweet themselves into existence. Words become lowest common denominator memes, correlating beliefs and desires into actions. To the point where Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Washington, and crypto conversational clusters start stress testing public confidence games like credit markets to their correlation limits. And the limits are not as difficult to break as you might think, just a threshold, 10 to 20% of the population believing otherwise, and suddenly bullets are worth more than Bitcoin. And of course, we get the worst of all antisocial behaviors, mindless bots, anonymous mobs, hyperfinancialization. Now, what government governance model has led to this? Well, it's not completely $1, one vote capitalism because users get to use a platform for free and data creators have no residual rights. But it's also not one person, one vote democracy because there are clearly a class of shareholders profiting off cleavages and collision courses. It's actually a tragedy of the conversational commons combining the worst aspects of captured communism, one conversational commons like nationalized oil fields and the worst aspects of capitalism where a few control a rent extracting brain fracking monopoly. It's something between or oscillating between synthetic technocracy where an elite optimizes with a God's eye view and corporate libertarianism that sends rents to a class of shareholders increasingly correlated with technocrats. Now, could generative foundation models make our conversations worse? How? Well, GFMs are trained off various data sets, including we can assume fairly conversations in the information commons scraped from the internet. They generate text by identifying correlations and finding complex nonlinear relationships between words and phrases within the training data. The problem is not simply that the data sets from our information commons have traveled outside their context, the facts, background beliefs, and relationships that the words embed within, the problem it, more deeply is that GFMs can recombine data sets into plausible deep fakes that flood the information commons, which then feed back into training models in a vicious cycle, accelerating context collision into full context collapse. When our background beliefs about consensus reality fracture, we also lose our ability to form strings of sounds that are intelligible conveying meaning. For communication to happen, a shared background of beliefs is required, that I'm here, that I'm talking, and an assumption that most of what I am saying I actually believe to be true. Disagreement and agreement alike are intelligible only against a background of massive agreement. Meaning and belief are inextricably linked. But is there another future? where GFMs augment our communicative capacity and make us more intelligible to each other while grounding us in truth and a shared consensus reality. Where instead of collapsing us into singularity, we expand into plurality. I think so. How do we get there? Well, many model social graphs on individuals, but individuals are really networks of groups just as groups are networks of individuals. They are a mutually defined duality like waves and particles. So model emergent groups, not just sovereign individuals. Step two, reintroduce the boundaries we have in physical space into digital space. Make the physically implicit digitally explicit. Not all communication should be broadcast into space. And as an extension of two, represent memberships to groups with socially programmable objects represented here as triangles that confer rights of participation and importantly make explicit the channel's governance mechanism. Is governance one person, one vote, one token, one vote, quadratic vote? Is it an intention auction? Express the mechanism in a governance triangle. Now the constellation of these triangles represent our access and governance over the digital communication channels which we participate in. You can call them soulbound because they represent your access and no one else's. Or you can call them community bound as communities grant these memberships or access rights. 
Again, like wave particle duality, individuals and groups are two different angles to the same phenomena. So let's take the community view. When a community has, for example, one person, one vote, each member holds this programmable triangle, representing their access right or credential to the community conversation and their right to vote on how this channel is governed and how their shared conversational data is used. For example, what information the community chooses to reveal, to whom, in exchange for what, money or information from another group? In other words, the triangle confers the right to vote on the group's privacy. Now, some channels might not have a governance rights. If everyone is part of the Putin channel, for example, it becomes clear to them that holding a black triangle, Putin controls a channel. Here, the triangle is simply making the implicit explicit. Now, once we represent governance, the next step is to improve it, to better price influence. Rather than the perils of one person, one vote, or one token, one vote, where influence is either too cheap or too expensive, we can make the marginal cost of influence proportional to how much you value a good through quadratic voting, quadratic funding, or some variation of square root voting. Now, quadratic voting and funding are just partial correctives to the majoritarian tyrannies of one person, one vote, and the plutocracy of one dollar, one vote, pushing us towards the center. But it's not enough because it's just correcting for one kind of correlation, where there are many other hidden correlations because of our conversational social ties. To draw an analogy to stars, on the surface, we look like these self-sovereign stars emanating idiosyncratic beliefs and desires through space and time. And so we square root over the intensity of our preferences so we can differentiate and also see the light from other stars, as light also bear, obeys an inverse square law. The light is also a wave and has properties instantaneously entangled with other light waves across vast distances. So what we want to know is underneath the intensity of our preferences, underneath the intensity of my light, how correlated our spin or biases with other people's light waves by this invisible, messy, stochastic social process we call communication, especially when digital communication accelerates these entanglements across distance. So rather than treat people as the same uncorrelated, non-conversational, sovereign individual without social ties, we take an extra step. We cluster people by their overlap and similarity and then discount influence based on shared conversational memberships or shared triangles, as well as their revealed behavior. In other words, we don't treat a hundred duped puppets or mindless bots having the same narrow clustered conversations the same way as a highly intersectional person debating across very different groups. We acknowledge the spin or bias of correlated conversational groups and discount against it so they don't secretly collude to swamp voting. For example, if this is a simplified representation of my conversational clusters, and this is a representation of my siblings, you would find these conversational overlaps. No two people are having the same conversations, but everyone has varying degrees of overlap and social distance to everyone else. We acknowledge this overlap and discount for the correlation. Now, financial markets here actually offer a helpful analogy. Just as a portfolio manager rings out in the idiosyncratic risk of poor managerial judgment and dysfunctional corporate culture by diversifying across less correlated assets, similarly, communities can wring out the idiosyncratic risk by discounting across correlated conversational clusters, prone to share the same bias and make the same errors in judgment. Now, this doesn't eliminate systematic risk, but it does wring out the idiosyncratic risk which left unchecked unnecessarily adds risk to the system and obfuscates the real systematic risks for us to focus on. So back to our governance triangle, if quadratic voting and funding are partial correctives, adding correlation discounting turns governance into a prism, allowing communities to bend and refract what is otherwise a monolithic light into differentiated colors, so we can see the unique colors of the less biased, less correlated perspectives sharply and in their full brilliance. <clears throat> this prism governance is consensus across difference, where we weigh the intensity of preferences of the more conversationally distant and less correlated and less overlapping to surface proposals more likely to be in the community's broader interest rather than any cluster's private interest, 
which might give that private cluster more information or control over everyone else. So consensus across difference also implies community collusion resistance. Collusion resistance is particularly important when a community is negotiating to share data with another community, which may have overlapping members and a conflict of interest. Or when it, for example, decides to say auction off or federate some of their data to a third party, which may have overlapping shareholders. Now, when communities rely on consensus across difference as a governance mechanism and scale up in their cooperative agreements with other communities, they form collusion resistant networks where the more conversationally distant communities have greater influence than the clustered and conversationally near. Checking the concentration, again, of information and control, or what we call power, of a cluster of groups and instead rebalancing it perpetually as these groups stochastically recombine. So instead of private goods, networks are able to generate shared networked goods resistant to political capture and economic extraction. Now, what does this mean for the individual? Well, just as collusion resistance leans on the diversity among the very conversationally distant or least correlated to surface what's in the network's broader interest, community recovery leans on the diversity of your least correlated conversational partners to secure your private interest or account where a qualified majority of your uncorrelated conversational partners can recover your account. In other words, Collusion resistance for a network implies community recovery for the individual. So now we start to get a more robust sense of what we mean by decentralization, not by reference to these other concepts begging for definitions or by treating all people the same with one person, one vote or treating all money equally with one token, one vote. Rather, decentralization requires surfacing hidden correlations where events are not as statistically independent as presumed to be, leading to accidental failures, or when people are not as conversationally distant as presumed to be, leading to intentional attacks. Fault tolerance and attack resistance are not inherent properties, but actually relational properties. And failures are the result of hidden correlations leading to hidden governance games or hidden triangles. The prism of collusion resistant governance protects against these failures, starting with communities and scaling into networks. So we arrive at a conception of decentralization that is coherent across all social scales, individuals, communities, and networks. Collusion resistance, consensus across difference, and community recovery are actually mutually implicated properties of decentralized systems at different social scales. So now that we have a conception of how decentralization works, how are these concepts relevant for generative foundation models or AI, and in particular, augmenting our communicative capacity? Recall GFMs are trained off various data sets, and some of these data sets, again, are scraped from the information commons, it's fair to assume. And moreover, there are increasing returns from economies of scale and economies of scope to these models. The more inputs and the greater diversity of inputs they receive, the more powerful they are at representing a mysterious syntax, the rules of grammar underlying human communication. Now, it's not feasible for communities to train their own frontier model that can have as rich a syntax as these large language models. Moreover, the underlying architectures and structures actually have more similarities and differences. So what can we do? Ideally, conversational communities would fine tune and adapt frontier models to their local context, using the prism of consensus across difference to surface diverse agreement on important questions like what constitutes training data for the local adaptation? What privacy preserving techniques should be used? How adjustments to the weights and biases of these adapted models should be made in both supervised learning and reinforcement learning? In this way, communities could have sovereignty in how this model behaves when it comes to things that are relevant to them. And someone from China, for example, wouldn't have as much an authority to say how the model should behave when it comes to questions about Audrey Tong as someone in Taiwan, for example. 
building on subsidiarity, many communities running their local adaptations on these GFMs could feed back elements or properties to the larger GFM in a federated way. Or better yet, these partially localized and adapted models could help communities negotiate with each other to share data about each other, to build larger nested adaptations. So we would have localized adaptations interoperating, overlapping, and recombining into larger adaptations with partially shared data sets. And by using consensus across difference at the local level and scaling up to collusion resistance at the network level, this larger networked AI could capture and refract out the background shared beliefs of local context composing into network context and feed back these properties back into the frontier model in a federated way to improve the weights and biases of the GFM. So localized adaptations would continuously improve on the frontier model while the frontier model in return would fine tune from the local networked model. And in sum, we would get partial adaptations interoperating with other partial adaptations that together form a network model that improves fine tunes and ultimately aligns a frontier model in a, in, in, in a federated, federated way. The analogy, if there is one, is imagine there's a fleet of giant ships that are actually more similar than different from each other. And as they stop in each port, they add on a sail, getting bigger and more powerful. These ships all have a magnitude and direction. Now, at the same time, there's a sea of smaller boats with much more differentiation, rowboats, fishing boats, speed boats, shrimp boats, and so on. And they have their own magnitudes and directions. Now, imagine all these smaller boats latch a rope on to the larger ships, gaining the speed and momentum of the larger ship but at the same time, shifting the magnitude and direction of the ship. Now, we don't know in advance how these forces will cancel each other out. Instead, the main question for us is how many ropes does a small boat get or how strong do we want these ropes to be? In other words, how much influence should these smaller boats have? Do they all get treated the same? Is it based on how much gold they have? Or... Do we look at where these boats came from, how similar they are, and how many of them have walkie-talkies coordinating their pull? We aim for a consensus across difference at the boat level and collusion resistance at the ship level. So like decentralization, we get a rich conception of AI alignment that is coherent and consistent across all social scales, individuals, communities, and networks, discounting the biases of conversationally near and correlated where the most distant communities check and constrain and fine tune the weights and biases of a networked AI, and where ceaselessly recombining communities lead to richer expressions of overlapping complex and canceling out preferences. And in the process, we get rich information provenance, where we can tell if an artificial generation arose from a socially distant group without conversational overlap or if the generation emerged from credible conversational clusters with shared secrets and perhaps designated verifier proofs. And this, of course, empowers us to curate our own attention and engage in conversations about credible information, facilitating the depth and breadth of richer conversations and greater networked cooperation. Now, why can't we get our collusion-resistant AI today? Well, that would require frontier models like OpenAI to share their model. Now, taking a principle of charity here, right? they, they don't want to do this because we don't have our boats lined up, so to speak, and malicious, well-coordinated pirate ships could come to over-influence over the frontier model. We want everyone to have access to nuclear energy, but not everybody should have nuclear weapons, which takes us back here to the task of reintroducing digital boundaries and representing governance with objects, triangles that refract out consensus across difference and reintroduce context. But instead we're here, erasing boundaries, contemplating instead eyeball scans and one person, one vote schemes. That's why we need to start building new communication channels that enable communities to localize credible governance and build a collusion resistant governance infrastructure we need. And to get us started, a plural cooperative known as the PCC 
has introduced and gifted a plural communication channel as a starting point for experimentation. And it's, it's simple, it's a playful start, it's a discourse fork where the agenda is surfaced by collusion resisting quadratic voting. Now this discourse fork allows you to express the intensity of your preferences with hearts, but at the same time, it recognizes and discounts the social cluster you're a part of based off correlation factors set by the community, whether it be workplace, geography, or political affiliation, or so on. This way, minority vo voices don't get drowned out and communities can surface questions which multiple perspectives agree on is interesting. And it's a playful first step, but we nonetheless hope communities will run their own instance of this experiment and innovate on top of it. And with tools like this, the goal is to augment our communicative capacity and cooperation across groups, harnessing collective intelligence. So with credible information, agents can ceaselessly and fluidly recombine into new groups with a multiplicity of aims into a thickening web of interweaving solidarities that cuts open asymmetries in information and control, what we call power. Many people communicating in a networked way, governing partially, plurally, continuously recomposing into fluid social groups so one or a cluster doesn't come to dominate them all. And so ironically, to keep AI aligned, we just have to keep talking and talking about the things that matter to us, like love, but to the people we actually love with boundaries around these conversations. And then AI can help us keep talking not to just our near and dear, but also to the conversationally distant, the foreign and the strange, generating conversational bridges to communities at any social scale, near and far, and ultimately keeping language a source of nourishment. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Pooja. Um, so now we're gonna open it up to questions. Yay. Yes, hello, my name is Devansh. Um, I had, a, it was a phenomenal talk. I really, really enjoyed it and very concrete examples you gave. Um, my question is that kind of a lot of theories about prejudice show that the one way to reduce prejudice is to bring opposing groups to talk to one another. So my concern with this model is that if I am a community organizer that is part of many different groups, would that then discount my strength because of that as a result as a, as a result of that? Um, not necessarily. It depends. I mean, the the mechanism design is to pro, pro social mechanism design should encourage right intersectionality. And um, imagine if you weren't part of so many groups, but you were just part of two and everybody else is part of two, right? Then you're kind of put under the same square root and discounted even more so that this rich intersectionality actually, uh, you know, it depends which context you're you're in, but um, it's, uh, I, I don't see it necessarily cutting against you, but I would encourage, I, let's make this a group conversation. There's some like really great minds on this call. Joel is on the call as well as uh, David, and they've thought about these questions. Um, but I would I wouldn't say it's uh, ne necessarily the case that you are discounted because you're more intersectional. Actually, the goal is to to um, encourage intersectionality. Hey, Pooja, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was hoping uh, you could give uh, me in some intuition around uh, like I, I get the uh, fine tuning aspect of models, but I'm having trouble uh, figuring out exactly what would communities do with these uh, generative models um, that you envision? Oh, I mean, so I think LLMs have really a lot of potential to help communities converse more intelligently. So a lot of people in this group, for example, are familiar with Polis, right? Now imagine mm -hmm. you have uh, an LLM that is like, you know, a partial adaptation of your built off of sort of your community shared data. So if you have sort of idiosyncratic uses of certain words, right, it's it's better able to capture that nuance and help make new prompts and new suggestions, right, to bridge and find maybe perhaps more cleavages or find consensus points. So I think Communities uh, will definitely be running, you know, their own LLMs, especially when they're trying to form cooperative agreements with other communities. 
And you know, AI can be very assistive in um, having these conversations. I see. So the idea is that communities would spin up a language model to kind of represent and negotiate with other communities, language models uh, and users, uh, is that? Yeah, and also to communicate with itself, right? To like better, so you, you have a community and you want to govern yourself better. You wanna surface different insights. You wanna have more intelligent conversations, right? Um, words, there, there's a lot of, so, you know, I have a legal background, right? And so constitutional interpretation is uh, a lot of debates on the scope of words, right? And there's a debate about, well, what are the facts and circumstances that impute meaning, right? Or limit the meaning. And so, but the same thing happens in groups. Like when we talk about rights or like the scope of freedom or like, right, you know, the, the how, how to divide the boundaries, shared boundaries between you and your neighbor, right? These are all negotiations and they require us to use words. And, and sometimes, you know, especially as we're entering in this like, context collision phase, as you might've noticed at like Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner tables or like when broader gatherings of families, people are just like talking over each other, right? And it's almost, they've sort of entered this like correlated meme verse and their meaning of words just doesn't really overlap with yours. And they have a com coming from a completely different context. Right. And we need to kind of like narrow, you know, these gaps or like bring find ways to like bring people peacefully together and kind of correct for for this. What I think is a, um, you know, an unnecessary collision course. Thanks. So, uh, so oh, sorry, you go. Sorry. Thanks. Um, somewhat related to the last, the last topic, it seems like having an LLM that could do like a explain your conversation, but assuming my context seems way closer to like what can actually be built now compared to something that is like, take uh, like 60% of this person's perspective and 40% of this person's perspective and give me an LLM that it has like that as a perspective that you would kind of need to do uh, like this quantitative weighting that you would want for quadratic voting Oh in well, the, the design of these systems is that yeah. Tell me, right, Sorry, right. So, like the, the voting, the you know, the collusion of quadratic voting is not necessarily to, uh, uh, like, it, it can be used in a lot of different ways, right? So the 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 the, the, the maybe the best way to think about it is. Step one: a community has to engage an LLM to begin with. And have it train off of their data and right they don't necessarily want it to train off of all of their data maybe just when the town hall starts and then ends right and do this sort of an incremental fashion and so um the you know collusion resistant quadratic voting is just kind of a a, a compromise approach that you know reconciles majority and minority voices but actually using that as a mechanism within like weights and biases or something is like uh, you know, maybe like 30 steps ahead there. So I, I think there's just like very small, uh, you know, implementations, very small, it's simple use cases that will help uh, generate, um, you know, consensus in groups and facilitate this like federation and governance. And then you can kind of like go from there. Oh. <laughs> Apologies, for that. thanks for the answer. Yeah, I was just going to think out loud, um, you know, I'm far from an AI expert, but I remember in the a few months ago being very surprised at how ChatGPT could get a prompt like explain X to me like you were, you know, uh, I don't know, a clown or, you know, a Midwestern swing voter or something, right? Midwestern swing state voter. And it seems like what you're saying is that, um, we can use these uh, like plural mechanisms to try to train models such that when we ask it a question like that, right, to take the role of some community, right, we're somehow going to be doing that in a way that is better or more uh, uh, amenable to agreement or something like that. Is that is that correct? Or just translate it, like make people intelligible, 
right? Mm. And people are intelligible and you kind of understand, okay, this is a person's context, then you can have you can have a more productive conversation. And, you know, um, and if you do need to agree on something, agree. I, I don't want to uh, push finding consensus too much because conflict is also important, right? And social recombination is important. So at least mm. people understand, you know, two people might say the same word and they think there's a false consensus, right? And actually it means something very different for you and me, or the opposite might be true, right? Um, so um, communication and intelligibility, I think is something LLMs can do, but we have to you know, first start localizing and reintroducing social context. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah, and thanks for the talk. Thank you. That builds on, builds on your work, Joel. <laughs> yes. Speaking of other work, Pooja, um, can you recommend a few articles or resources for people who want to go deeper into some of these concepts you shared? Oh, dear. Um, you know, so I actually am not an AI expert either. So, uh, you know, we, we all are uh, faking it till we make it. Um, I, I can uh, put together a list of articles after this and like share it with the Plurality Network and get a few inputs. On awesome, that. I would love that. Thank you. Especially on the partially localized adaptations. That's something that is has not been really explored. But this is sort of what the plurality network is here to do, right? These are really frontier ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'll say one thing, you know, in the in the talk, I talked about idiosyncratic risk and systematic risk. And like let's a lot of these AI risk debates, you know, I take them seriously. But one thing that we can do and use pluralism to help us do is ring out the idiosyncratic risk of these systems, right? And by acknowledging and correcting for biases. So we don't have like a model that just sort of runs off with some, you know, tyrannical majority idea and like wipes off, right? A country right, off, of, off of the earth or something crazy. I mean, there's so many scenarios, right? But a lot of these scenarios are just like, okay, well, that, that those were pre those preferences really didn't cancel each other out in the right way or were expressed. Now there are systematic risks because these are like nonlinear combinations. And I think there's a lot of like really hard and deep questions there, um, but that we should focus on, right? Um, and this kind of allows us to like, right, put these other sort of, minimize the risk of these other catastrophic scenarios and like really focus on what are the real, you know, big AI risk problems um, from, you know, models that have like, you know, nonlinear functions and can just like shoot off, you know, in some some direction. And again, I'm not an expert here. And I think everybody, a, a lot of people on this call are much more mathematically sophisticated on this than I am. So just an area of future research for you. Uh, this might be a bit. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rose. No, I was just. Okay. I just had one thought, which is that, uh, like, rather than dissuading bad actors from using LLMs to do like dangerous stuff, I think what you're proposing is more about how do we build good AI models. But I mean, it's not really solving the AI alignment problem in a sense because the good actors will use the good models and the bad actors will use the bad models, right? Well. When you want to uh, cooperate and form right greater networks of cooperation, then that forces you to right uh, negotiate with other communities. Um, and so, if you want to be the rogue actor that like you know is on an island like the Bond villain, right, <laughs> that doesn't uh, cooperate with everybody and like run your rogue AI model, then uh, yeah, that it, that's an example of a systematic risk that is like not addressed, but at the same time, maybe something like a more intelligent networked AI um, that is across these different groups could maybe deal with that or, or predict that uh, better than, than if it wasn't, right? And if it was just sort of like, because you can kind of see, you know, predict like, well, um, you know, there's a sort of interesting uh, divergence on, on uses of words and with sort of like these maybe violent connotations, right? And then that can maybe surface easier for, for everybody else. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. A defensive AIs. Evan? Oh, I tag onto that and say, like, I, 
I view this not as like what you, what, what you presented, not as a solution to the alignment problem, but the solution of what to do when you have an alignable AI, who do you align it with? Which is something that not a lot of people end up talking about. And so I was, I was really glad to hear this. Um, I don't tend to think that it makes sense to have some like, like try to hard code in something around uh, like autonomy and uh, like freedom from pain that would make sense as like, if you if you had an alignable AI, you probably want some like baseline things and then put people's preferences on top of that. But I also realize that that's like very natural rightsy rather than like maybe something that is like much farther beyond that um, to the extent that like none of those natural rights uh, are without caveats. How do you think about this in like a, you're building a hypothetical world or you're, you're designing a hypothetical world and proposing one. Um, do you think that there's a role for uh, like the analog of some updated natural laws when it comes to it, uh, building and deploying powerful problem solvers in the world? Okay, so I understood the first half of your what you said, but not the second half. So let me respond to the first half. So I would say like, uh, so certain like things like autonomy or freedom of pain, like these these don't exist just independently. Like they exist in a trade-off space, right? And life is like a series of trade-offs. And like, even if you look at say like the Bill of Rights in the constitution, right? Like freedom of speech, you can't yell, you know, fire in a crowded theater. There are like limitations, right? And there are compromises. And so even these concepts like rights, like pick your favorite, you know, autonomy, freedom of, freedom from pain or, or whatever it is, you're going to have people interpret this very differently based off of their particular context, their background beliefs, yeah. the circumstances, and even culturally, right? And so- I can, reframe, I can reframe my question as, do you think there should be some assumed universal context with respect to a small number of rights that we try to maintain so that we have consensus across that? in some respect, or do you think that like le fully leaning into uh, a plural solution is sufficient and that we don't need any sort of consensus, even of context, even for a small number of rights? I mean, <clears throat> there's, it's, you know, pluralism is a value, right? Um, itself. So, yeah. and, and that's like tolerance. And, yeah. Right. It comes and, with and paradoxes. Protecting like minority views, right? Do you want to call that a right uh, or, or a value? I'd probably say it's more of a value. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think I can't really, it, it's, let me, let me noodle on that a little bit more because again, even in our current, from a perspective of somebody who, you know, is a law and spent a lot of time thinking about constitutional litigation and like, you know, facilitating that um, and also spend a lot of time in corporate governance, right? Lawyers, we spend a lot of time kicking the tires on the boundaries of these words. And these are actually very rich social consensus games. And so what I'm trying to do is acknowledge on a sort of deeper level, the kind of philosophy of language and mind stuff underpinning even constitutional orders Right, even corporate governance and you know consensus around intelligibility and like meaning of words. So um yeah. <laughs> Feels like an appropriately nuanced answer to a ridiculously broad question. Thank you for thank you for thinking about that. And I look forward to hearing um what thoughts you might have at some point. Uh -huh. Savanesh, did you want to chime in with those thoughts? Sorry, was that question directed towards me? Um, no, um, Devanesh posted some some thoughts in the chat. So just wanted to see if, if you wanted to share them. Otherwise, folks can feel free to read those in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I have one final quick question, which is curious on your thoughts on OpenAI's AI governance challenge that they put out and kind of like how that's structured in relation to some of these ideas you shared or anything that you're hoping to see um, come out of that work? Yeah, I think it's it's great. I'm excited about it. Um, I think there's 
a lot of experiments to do. So the PCC is like collusion resistant quadratic voting, right? And that's just like one experiment, but you can imagine, and I invite everybody here to think about this with me in the plurality network and anybody who's watching this, um, you know, how you actually, you want some, you know, and Joel, you can speak about this too, a uh, way to represent like social groups, right? And one way to do that is through ex ante commitments, right? And that's the, the, the work on soul bound, community bound tokens and credentials, verifiable credentials, right? That's one way to do that. And another way is to look at like revealed behavior. And that tells you a lot about somebody's affiliations as well and their solidarities. And so you need some kind of combination of ex ante and ex post information. And, you know, there's really interesting tools. I could see that kind of feedbacking in with something like Polis, right? In a, in a very interesting way and augmenting that tool um, and, you know, using and even augmenting polis with some of the mechanisms that I've talked about. Um, and so there's, and, and in that way, we can start to at least recognize the different social groups and conversational clusters and start to build, help one, build boundaries around them and two, kind of correct for these biases um, in the short term. So long term build boundaries and, you know, uh, kind of rethink our digital commons and then short term, like build, build tools that um, avert some of the more like, you know, uh, catastrophic risks. Um, not all of them, but just some of them. Hope that makes sense. Great. Any final thoughts or questions? Uh, yeah, I just had one final question on the tactical details of how you might go about implementing some of this. So kind of one thing I've been seeing in Gitcoin is that quadratic funding and voting doesn't work when the numbers are small. To give an example, like kind of the top voted project in a round had 41 votes and it got around $6,000 and a project with just uh, nine votes managed to get $7,000 because each member gave a lot more funding. So kind of it didn't really represent the will of the community. And I think kind of, so is like in you know, this model, I feel like we'll just actually make this problem worse that if you're using this sort of collusion resistant model and the, and, the, and the participation is low, it's going to then make it even lower because kind of it's weighted that way. And, you're, and, you're, and so, so that's one concern that if the voting participation is low, how would it work over there? And um, the second concern is also just how do you actually find, the, find this out? And like, would you say that if voters are from the same DAO and hold the same DAO tokens, the same governance platforms, they should be like kind of privileged less compared to voters who are members of disparate DAOs. I was just wondering how you might go about some of those tactical details of implementing it. So I think, um, so on the participation thing, like, uh, so how you get general participation is uh, uh, in, in voting is a hard question. And I think there's really interesting uh, mechanisms around delegation that, um, the challenge with delegation is you have to, um, you know, correct for um, the, this principal agent problem where you're basically seeing control and with somebody who has more information and make sure you don't turn into a sibyl, right? So, but there's some um, possible mechanisms around that to increase participation, which is not like the scope of this conversation. Um, but the, but I don't think it's like when you say it doesn't represent the community will, I don't really know what you mean because if people look at the algo and the whole point of, one of the big points of this talk was getting people to embrace the fact that there is an implied governance structure and there is an implied algo, right? In our attention, um, you know, if people embrace like, you know, a cluster oriented match or whatever, then that is sort of representing the will of the community, right? And you don't, so I'm not I'm not really sure what you're saying. It's not representing the will of the community. Um, I think I'm not sure where Gitcoin is, how much they've implemented the collusion resistance stuff. Joel, you could speak more about that than than I can. Um, I don't know. Maybe you want to maybe you want to pipe in, Joel, because you're much closer to that. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, it's my fourth day on the job at Gitcoin, so not much implementation has been done yet. I can tell you that. Um, but yeah, we're. I mean, actually. Ivancha and I have a call scheduled for later today to kind of unpack all of these issues more, it turns out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that in general for any, like 
for me, I see these mechanisms um, as very malleable kind of objects that really mostly exist to kind of help us figure out our political orientations as a group, right? And help us figure out what really fits best for us. You know, like the original papers about quadratic funding and voting uh, kind of focused on these utility maximizing properties, but it's, it's very kind of unclear to me how much these utility functions really exist in real life, right? And so I think that in a more kind of applied context, like you said, Puja, the point of these mechanisms is to help communities realize, you know, their collective, you know, will as far as governance goes. And so to that end, um, you know, a collusion resistant mechanism or a plural mechanism could be fantastic if uh, the values of the co community like kind of align with that. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of malleability and a lot of room for interpretation according to the exact you know needs of any given community. Um, hopefully that makes sense, but just my take on it. Well, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much everyone for joining and thank you Pooja for this talk. I really enjoyed it too and um, look forward to, to learning even more about some of these ideas. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you for listening. Bye Thanks. everyone.